I want to make sure we're still learning the foundational skills and not just letting AI do everything for us. What we need to change in education and why we need to change it and why I think AI might be the finally the thing. Oh my gosh, this is going to save me so much time. The topic of today's podcast is learning evolution, the new era of AI in the classroom with Carl Hooker. Unpacking Education is brought to you by Avid.org. Avid believes that we can raise the bar for education. To learn more about Avid, visit their website at avid.org. Welcome to Unpacking Education, the podcast where we explore current issues and best practices in education. I'm Rena Clark. I'm Paul Beckerman. And I'm Winston Benjamin. We are educators. And we're here to share insights and actionable strategies. Education is our passport to the future. Our quote for today is from our guest's new book, Learning Evolution, the New Era of AI in the Classroom. In the book, our guest Carl Hooker writes, AI will not replace a teacher. However, a teacher that utilizes AI correctly in their daily work will be much more effective teacher, which means students will become much more effective learners. All right, Winston, what, what's that making you think about? So uh, for me, I hear a, a bit of this idea of efficiency, right, where like it's about maximizing productivity with minimizing, minimizing waste and effort. And I think a lot of time teachers are doing so much work that they are unable to save or not waste personal time physical and mental energy. So I think having the opportunity to be more efficient and effective teachers is a really an important thing for teachers to realize how they can use a tool to uh, maximize their um, efforts to support students. Yeah, efficiency is always good, right? Yeah, not feel guilty about it. I have, have some that, but it's interesting. Somebody was saying, oh, that's cheating or you're doing it. I'm like, so? <laughs> Like, you're not cheating. It's, it's like right? <laughs> being more efficient. So you're just jealous because I have more time to go home and do other things. But it's just interesting, something new, attitude shift. But I was thinking about the part where it's talking about replacing teachers or that human aspect. And there's so many aspects of teaching that I just don't think can ever be replaced. Um, and I think that's where that nervousness comes. And we talk about it all the time on here, but it's that building relationships that human relationship piece that's never going to be replaced, the, the connections, how teachers and educators can inspire, show empathy. Um, so, however, as you said, Winston, AI can increase teachers' ability to, like, I think they can provide more personalized learning, differentiation, and they can do that in a more streamlined way efficient way so that they actually have more time and energy to build relationships with students. So they have that more one-on-one -on -one face time rather than doing the busy work. Mm -hmm. So it's not really cheating. It's just being smarter about it. Yep. Work smarter, not harder. Y using your tools, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, we'd like to welcome our guest, Carl Hooker, to the show. Carl has been an educator for over 25 years. He's held a variety of positions in multiple districts, including first grade teacher and director of innovation and digital learning. Among other accomplishments, Carl has written eight books as a keynote speaker, a consultant, and a podcast host. So welcome, Carl. Hey, thank you for having me. It's good to be on this <laughs> side of the the microphone, so to speak. It's always I'm always the host. So as as Rena was talking to Winston was talking, I was like, I wanted to jump in with follow up questions. And I'm like, wait, stay back. <laughs> I'm the guest. Uh, but thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. You bet. And congrats on the new book. Thank you. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, after so many book uh, so many times writing books, it's been interesting to see because, of course, a book about AI, the first question I get usually is, well, did you let AI write the whole book for you? I'm like, yeah. I am like, have you seen how AI writes? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> not at all. And I think... Uh, and I think that's kind of, uh, you know, it, it, uh, that being said, I will say it is a great thought partner. I've heard a teacher refer to it as that. And I think that's a great way of saying it. So in previous books that I've written, whenever I've had a creative block, I'll take a week or two off and just take, separate myself from it. In this case, because I knew that the topic was ever present, I would use AI to kind of help me push through the block. And I think 
that was extremely helpful. Like when I get to a stuck category, I'm like, how about brainstorming some ideas for what a social social studies teachers would use in high school with an image generator? And it would give me a few. And I'm like, well, those are kind of generic, but I can now take a couple of these and then apply my own spin to it, that human angle. And so, yeah, it, it was it was a, a fun book to write. Uh, and, and it's, you know, I'm updating it already, uh, of course, but it's not really about tools. Cause it's not like a, you see the chat GPT for teachers books and those are great. Um, this is more of a, um, I would say more of a higher level view about what we need to change in education and why we need to change it and why I think AI might be the, finally, the thing that gets to what Rena was just talking about personalized learning. The thing we've been talking about, you know, for several decades, <laughs> maybe this will be the thing that does it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. For sure. I'm kind of curious, you know, as you did your research for the book and were out and about talking to teachers, what was their reaction to AI in the classroom like? Maybe what were they seeing as opportunities or concerns or maybe a little both? What were you hearing out there? Yeah, you know, I started the research on this last January, which was about a month and a half after ChatGPT came out. Um, and we're recording this in January of 24. And what was interesting was just the landscape of as I approached teachers in the spring was a lot of fear, concern, trepidation. Then they started to embrace a little bit. Um, by August, I saw the biggest concern being academic integrity and cheating, which, which Winston mentioned too. You know, and so uh, what's happening now is I see that there is still that concern, but a new concern has risen over the last couple of months, and it is the concern of that students are going to be overly reliant, or humans will be, and therefore we're going to lose our creative uh, thinking and our critical thinking, um, which – you know, there's a counter to that too, you know, cause you it's, it's AI isn't doing it for us. We still are the ones that are prompting it. Um, as of this moment, I mean, <laughs> in 20 years, it may be doing a lot more of it for us, but, or even in 10 years, but right now it still takes our creative and critical thinking skills to, to make it generate what we want it to generate. So, um, but you know what, I I'll be honest. I mean, as much as I love AI, I do have also have those valid concerns. Like I want to make sure that we're not getting lazy as learners. And that's a, that's something that makes me nervous. I want to make sure we're still learning the foundational skills and not just letting AI do everything mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Paul. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, I totally get it. I've been kind of in the process of trying to write my parents' history. So I've been interviewing them and then trying to write that up into a book. It's like, it's so tempting just to dump all my notes in there and, and see what chat GPT will do. And I actually did that a little bit last night. Yeah. I did not like it. <laughs> so yeah. I scrapped. It was so verbose, verbose and it was making stuff up. And I was <laughs> like, that's not my parents. So I went back to writing it myself. But it did help me generate the questions to get started, you know, and it, it helped me do some of those things. So it was a, a co-author for me or, or a thought partner. Yeah, I, my, my dad, who I dedicate the book to, I have a three, uh, I didn't do just a one word dedication. It was like three pages because he passed in uh, April and he's always been my editor for my other books. And so I wrote a big series about him and kind of how AI played a role in his life actually to extend his life with some of the technology he had in his system, in his body to keep his heart pumping. But what was interesting was when he passed, my my mom says, you know, I want you to do the eulogy, you're a speaker. And, and I'll be darned if I sat there and stared at a blank screen for two weeks, I couldn't. I couldn't put a word to paper and what did I do? And I feel guilty. I felt guilty originally saying this. Now I don't feel so guilty, but um, kind of like what Rena was saying, the guilt of using it, right? But I did use AI to start and I said, give me, it didn't know anything about him, but I said, talk, talk to me about someone who served in the military, who went to Vietnam, who served his country, you know, who does this, who worked for, um, you know, a civic, uh, a civil duty because he worked for the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And so, and also was very generous. And I gave kind of all the general features and it gave me a skeleton, which then I filled in with story. Um, but I would say 20% of it was AI driven. And when I got done, everyone's like, wow, that was a great eulogy. I was like, well, I mean, I got to assist, you know, and, I, and again, <laughs> I don't know why, but we still feel a little guilt and maybe Rena, maybe it'll take, you know, maybe in a couple, three years, we won't feel that like Google was the same way, right? Where ooh, I Google searched that maybe, you know, to figure out what the answer was. Um, that was 20 years ago, but mm. maybe we'll get over that. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you for sharing that story. Thank you for sharing that story about mm -hmm. your pops. I'm, I'm sorry about his passing. But um, I got a quick question I, I, to, to help, because I know a lot of directors and people who are uh, making decisions are worried about how and what and why um, and trying to make better policies around AI. As a former director yourself of innovation and digital learning, what gets you excited about AI and what gives you pause, right? Uh, just to help some put a framework around AI. Sure. And I think it's I, I think it's a great question because, you know, people in roles that like the role I've had, I had for several years, 
whenever I got a new tool, like, so 2011, we rolled out the first one-to-one iPad program in the state of Texas. So I was basically an app manager. And I feel like this is deja vu all over again. There's an app for that. There's an app for that. There's an AI for that. There's an AI for that, right? And so what I did then is the same thing I'm doing now, which is I'm looking at, first of all, what does the tool provide? What does it give us that actually helps with learning? Secondly, and probably actually firstly, what is it doing with our data? What is it doing with student data? We see an influx in AI apps. And don't get me wrong, if I looked at my monthly bill right now, I probably got, it's almost like streaming services. Like I've bought so many AI apps lately that every month they keep renewing (laughs) because I'm trying them all out. But I also make sure I vet them before I hand them over to teachers and show it to them. So looking at those apps and vetting them for data privacy is something that I would be concerned with. But what gets me excited is, again, the idea of, and and one of you said it, it's that efficiency. It's what it could possibly bring. And when I show it to teachers, it's always, I love that kind of feeling of that aha moment that happens. And it always happens at every training I do where there's a moment where someone goes, oh my gosh, this is going to save me so much time. Or, oh my gosh, this is what I've been needing for a long time. You know, that that one tool, whether it's Magic School or even ChatGPT to help them just come up with like an idea or a framework around a weightlifting program that they're doing with their freshmen, you know, stuff like that. It's just, it's giving them that idea and that, that thought partnership um, that they didn't have before. So that makes me excited because I do think teachers are under a, a bit of a time famine we have been for for several centuries as we kind of continue to cram more standards and more responsibilities on them and not give them more pay. We needed something like this, I think, to kind of help us uh, get through that part of that so we can say, okay, now we can actually go back to the human side of teaching. We can take away all the administrivia, as I call it, and start actually working on the, the human part of teaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I see that as a huge benefit moving forward. And I kind of want to go back to, we talked about both you and Paul, and I know even myself how I've used AI. Um, But I think about my own kids. I have some fourth graders and a sixth grader. And so they're a little bit older, but then we have these kindergartners. If AI is all they've known, they're in a world where AI has always existed. I still have concerns about building, as you said, that creativity. How do we build those critical thinking skills alongside with AI? So how is it that, what are some of those best practices that we suggest for schools or teachers to use to really integrate AI responsibly? Yeah, I I, I think, well, the good good thing is right now is elementary in theory, because we know no kid has ever done anything that says 13 (laughs) plus or above if they're under 13, right? (laughs) Kids out there listening. (laughs) So the good thing is the teachers are still very much the gatekeepers at elementary level, which is where you're building a lot of those foundational skills. That said, I think it's important for teachers, especially probably third, fourth, fifth, to start some early modeling. Um, I did this with my daughter's class when I went and I do a lot of guest teaching, uh, just kind of keep myself in the classroom. And I brought in um, for a fourth grade lesson, I had it basically tell a story. I had them all write a story out of something they had done over the weekend. And then I should, then I had AI write a story about something I had done over the weekend. And I said, well, let's see how much of this is actually true. And we went through and talked like, I didn't do this. I didn't do that. Um, it doesn't even know. I mean, it's, it's not even close. Uh, and then I asked the kids, I go, now let's edit it. Let's change it. Let's add some spice to it. Cause you know, AI produces very generic, what it thinks is the most probable and plausible answer. So it's never going to give you that really kind of humanistic, exciting kind of spin to it. And so that was kind of fun for them. So modeling that at an early age, I think is important. Uh, and then as you go to the higher grades, uh, a good friend of mine, AJ Giuliani, has a kind of graphic that he shares that I shared in the book. And it's, you know, red light means we're not going to use uh, this is a non AI lesson. It's going to be a foundational skill that I need you guys to know. Um, yellow means we're going to use AI for components of it. There's some foundational stuff, but you're also going to be able to use AI for certain parts and we're going to identify those. And then green is, you know, I, I don't care if you use AI or not, because at the end and the outcome, you need to demonstrate that you understand whatever it is that we taught you. So yes, go ahead and use as much of it as you want. However, at the end, you're going to have to be able to know it backwards and forwards, probably through some sort of verbal representation, um, or through a presentation of some sort. Um, so I think uh, that those having those kind of graphics much like we did with cell phones and 15 years ago, you know, put the phones away, you can take them out. Um, and we may go through that again with AI, to be honest, because I think cell phones, you know, for a while we banned them. And then we said, no, use them for Kahoot and use them for everything else. And now what are we doing? Now I see them, they're back in the pockets again, because we're worried about, you know, distraction of it. Now this is different because it's not a tool that's trying to get their attention right now, like a phone is, but uh, it'd be interesting to see where we go through that permutation of AI. So right now I do think, I don't know about policy because I think policy takes 
months and board action and is probably already behind when it's published. But I do think guidelines and guardrails is what I've heard. The phrase that's been used quite a bit, having those in your classroom, best practices. I think that's smart uh, in terms of just identifying to kids, hey, this is okay or this isn't. And I'll go ahead and tell a quick story because she would get mad at me, so I won't tell her name. But I have a daughter. <laughs> I have three of them. My oldest one is a freshman, so now I've identified her, but I haven't said her name. Um, and if her teacher hears this, I'm sorry. Uh, last month, she was struggling with an ELA paper, and she was like, I need to write this paper. It's at the ethos and pathos. It's four paragraphs. It's due at midnight. It's 9 o'clock at night, Dad, and I'm just struggling. And so I was like, well, you know, what does your teacher say about using AI? And she's like, well, she doesn't say anything because they haven't been trained on it yet. Um, by the way, I'm going there in two weeks to train their entire staff. Um, but, uh, so I said, well, try ChatGPT, see what it can get you started. And then I want you to put it in a Google docs. I want you to look at the revision history and see how much of it did you just copy paste? Cause the first thing as a teacher, I would do is say, wow, you just took a chunk of text and pasted it. And I, now I want you to clean it up, make it your voice. Now I'm going to take the, the device from you and I want to quiz you on it and see how much you know verbally. And she was able to respond really well with it and knew it backwards and forwards. Like, okay, now go ahead and turn it in. Well, the next day, and I have a screenshot of it, but the next day she sent me a text like, dad, I got a hundred on that ELA essay using chat GPT. And I was like, wait, you didn't just use chat GPT. It assisted you <laughs> mm -hmm. be careful on how you choose mm -hmm. your words, <laughs> because that does sound like cheating. Uh, if you say it in a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's the whole boundary that we're all trying to figure out. You even mentioned it, you know, as an author, you know, where is that boundary between helping and doing for us? Yeah. When you publish a book in Amazon right now, like our, my book is in Amazon and also Barnes and Noble, but with Amazon, it asks you now when you actually publish your book, where, how much of this book was written by AI, how much of it did you utilize AI? And then with the images, it asks you that too. So it's not just the words, but the images, how much of it. So the cover of my book, I use Leonardo.ai to actually generate that image. Um, which is a beautiful artistic AI app. I don't use it for schools because it's also very much unfiltered. Um, so I don't ever demonstrate, I don't ever suggest it to schools, but it, the art that comes out of it is just phenomenal. And so I use it to generate the cover. And so I, of course, when I upload the book, you have to state all that now. So even Amazon's acutely aware of it. I mean, and I'm sure more and more as we go forward, authors, I'm sure you guys have read like something in the last few months where you're reading the blog and you're like, this looks an awful lot like someone just copied and pasted whatever chat GPT said. Uh, you don't even need an AI cheat detector. You can just kind of tell now because it always does like bullets or here are five things you should know about that. Right. Um, it seems like that's, that's the go. And I think teachers are going to be more keen to that. When I was a teacher, I called it parent intelligence. Like I knew when a, when a student was parent was actually doing the work for them. Like that's PI, <laughs> not AI, but, um, you can tell, right. You could be like, Oh, I know exactly what this is. That's not, that is not your work. You have never written that in your life, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think as we get more adaptable as teachers, we'll start to pick up on that too. Yeah. If the email starts with, I hope this email <laughs> finds you well. Uh, <laughs> you wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's just some dead giveaways. Everyone starts and with that. And it signs off with best or uh, be well. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, They're all the same. They're yeah. all the same. So you, you mentioned that um, teachers are still learning this themselves. And in a lot of districts, teachers haven't had a chance to get the training, you know, with all the other things that are on the list to learn. Um, so if you, and you are going into another district, what are the things that teachers do need to be aware of and, and kind of need to know in this journey. Yeah, I think what I do, and I, and I outline it at the end of the book too, is I think you have to at first, when you go into a room of teachers that are maybe some of them, right now I feel like it's about 30 to 35% whenever I ask them to raise their hands, how many of you have used any of these? So it's still not a lot. I, I, what I let them do first, I say, let's get all the concerns out first. So the first thing I always do in any training with AI is like, let's tell me everything you're worried about. And I'll tell you, it, it, you know, it varies from academic integrity to Terminator and the world's going to be taken over, right? Uh, which is always the extreme and that's always the example they use. But once we get that off our chest, I said, now let's look at some of the examples of how it can be used. And then you got to give them time to play with it because I'm... I'm a person who likes to use it. I don't, you can tell me about it all day or show me a video, but I need to get in there and actually play with it. So I usually start by giving them something fun to do. So I'll say like, have it, you know, put four things that are in your refrigerator right now and write a recipe for those four things. Or um, you're trying to, it's New Year's, you got New Year's resolutions, you're trying to do a workout plan, have it generate a workout plan for you and see what it comes up with. And then usually what they do is they see that it's decent, uh, not great, but pretty decent. And I'm like, well, it's a good start. And that's what I try to tell them. It's a rough draft. It's a good starting point. When you talk about like large language models with the image generators, it's a little bit different. Um, I do activities with those two where I have the, the best one that I've done recently is try to try to get an image generator to draw a picture of you, like actually go in, type in the text, describing yourself and seeing what it generates. 
Um, first of all, it's very, <laughs> it's a hard challenge because you have to really look at yourself in the mirror and say like, Ooh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a little bigger than that, or I have a little less hair. Or I have a little more gray in my beard, you know? So going in and actually saying it and then, then it talks, then I tell them about reprompting and, and editing your prompts and fine tuning your prompts and getting that image just right. And so that's a fun way of just seeing that they, they kind of laugh at it. And then of course they all look around the room and say, Oh, this must be Mary or that must be John. Um, but I think it's a good way to get them started. And then we then we travel down the bias path because I think that's I, mean, I read a whole chapter in the book about bias. And I think that's something they all have to be aware of uh, the bias that comes with it. And so, by the way, image generators, you know, probably some of the worst when you talk about bias, because when you write in uh, draw a nurse taking care of a robot, the robots all look very different. But let me ask you three. What do you think the nurses look like? Mm. Mm. White woman. Guesses? <laughs> what gender? <laughs> woman is correct. Yeah. Not white, though. You'd be surprised. The race, they're all the same race, Filipino, Asian descent, usually. And so you'll see this. Now, they've started to tweak some of the algorithms now, but for the first few times I did it. By the way, when I said basketball player reading a book, what do you think? Black male. Tall black male reading a book. Yep. The book's always different. The person, never the, never different. And a lot of that, it's a great conversation to have with teachers about why the tool itself isn't biased, but it's taking our own inherent biases that we put on the internet and then producing that for us. So being aware of it and then figuring out how do we can adjust to that bias, I think is important. It always touches off a good conversation uh, with teachers when we, when we bring it up. Mm. I appreciate the the way that you're supporting teachers and engaging with it. And it's for me, the, the the examples you gave of how to learn about AI seems it would be beneficial for students. But um, the question that I'm going to ask you, and I think it goes back to more of your um, way you ask your daughter to talk about her work. Right. So how do we help students learn to use AI to co-create with them? rather than AI creating for them, you know, especially in writing and research again, because kids speak as if they are just actors in it, not the person generating it, right? Like your daughter. So right. what are ways that we could support students thinking about it, create, co-creating with them? Well, I can tell you, that, I'll tell you, first of all, the way not to do it. And the way not to do it is to say you're not allowed to use it. Because once you tell a kid they're not allowed to use it, they're all going to use it. So, and, I, and, I, and I'll be fair. I mean, institutions like New York City Public D- DOE, they, they blocked it initially. Um, but to be fair to them, it, you know, a couple months later, they came back and said, okay, here are some structures that we could use. So I think having that guided use and saying, and actually having them use it, I, I'll, I'll use a story, uh, a friend of mine, uh, who I wrote this in the book too, and I have in one of my podcasts, he's a professor at USC, he does a public diplomacy, um, Dr. Nick Cole. And uh, his class for the last five years, he's had them write this paper, a position piece from another country, politicking the United States about climate change or some other topic. And he has them create this position piece. Um, what he did this year is he said, I want you all to use AI and I'm going to force you all to use it. So they all had to use ChatGPT to write out their paper. And then he said, now turn it in. No edits, no nothing. And so they all turned it in and he goes, okay, you can all get a B minus right now. He goes, or you can make it an A paper. And if you want to make it an A paper, you really need to know the country. You need to know the topic. You need to know the stuff that AI doesn't know. You need to know where the biases were, where the misinformation is, because there's a lot of misinformation that comes out of it. And he said, as a result of that, the papers he got were a lot higher quality. The kids actually, the kids, they're students, high, college students, but they actually knew a lot more about the topic than they would have the previous years when they just went in, did some research, wrote a paper, turned it in. They had to actually be smarter than AI. So I love that example of leaning into it a little bit. So I think we're going to have to do that with students to say, okay, lean into it, use it for this, call out the spots that where you're using it. Um, and not just for the written stuff. You know, I know you're talking about writing and research, but I also have a high school teacher who teaches photography. And he said to me, he goes, this is going to ruin everything. I can't tell what's real, what's not real. And I said, what do you mean? And he showed me an image of a kid, a video of a kid taking a picture and then adapting it using generative fill through Adobe Firefly. And, and he's like, I, that's not a, that's not a real photo. And he goes, I'm just going to flunk him. And I said, wait, I go, or you could say, turn in your original photo, the one you originally took. And I'm going to grade you for originality on that. But I also want you to turn in your AI assisted photo. And I'm going to grade you for the way that you've enhanced the photo, because let's be honest, Photoshop's been around for, you know, three decades. So, I mean, why not lean into that and say, I'm going to give you points for originality here and points for AI assistance here, and then use the two as a combined grade versus the, well, that's not a real photo. So I'm just going to flunk you. And I think it's reframing some of our thoughts around that. And then again, giving points for originality. And then lastly, I'll just say, the one thing that the kids can't cheat is process. Um, you can't use AI to cheat process. So 
ref, you know, reflecting on how you learned it. What did you learn about it? What were the emotional impacts of what it felt? What was your opinion? How did your opinion change when you started this project? Those kind of questions that AI can't answer are the ones that I would be doing as a teacher and saying, okay, I'm going to give you a grade for your final product, but I'm also going to give you a grade for how your process of actually learning this information went. And I think that's probably the biggest shift that's going to have to happen to really avoid like the whole, you know, everyone's going to, if you just say turn in a five paragraph essay, then yes, there's going to be a likelihood that kids are just going to use AI to do it. Um, But if you say turn in that essay, but also tell me about the process of what you did to research it, what did you learn from it? What was the takeaway? What was something that surprised you about it? Things like that. That's a little bit harder for AI to cheat on uh, at this time. So I'd say that balance of process and product is huge. So we usually have a, a t-shirt thing and you can't cheat the process. I was going to yes. say, Ooh. yes, yes, that's it. It's definitely a t-shirt. Moment. Then we can yeah, do an AI generated photo to go it. with it. We can make a, <laughs> we could. See? I, I have a shirt that says Carl GPT. I didn't wear it for the show, but I do have a shirt that says Carl GPT because <laughs> I, I'm generating my own AI bot right now and it's going to help me answer all the emails that I get from spam. Um, and keep them busy for a while. That's my hope. Nice. Uh, I'm working on spamming the spammers. I appreciate that. It's like keeping those marketing phone callers on the phone for too long. I do that too. I think that's a pastime. I'm like, I'm going to keep texting back and forth with you. What are you talking about? I don't know what you mean. I don't have a hundred. Where do I send the gift card? What do you mean? Yeah. Uh, I, I really appreciate in in your book and even in this. Am I? conversation we've been talking about learning best practices um and not about any specific tool um so i'm just wondering if you have any favorite tools you've mentioned a few and what's captured your own interest and imagination uh the latest one and now you could ask me this question in two weeks and it'll be different uh because this is just again the world we're in with the explosion of these apps right now the latest one i'm into right now is hey jen uh, H-E-Y dot G-E-N. And it's um, what I love about it. So it's a video capturing tool. Tool Essentially what you do is you take two minutes or more of video of you. You can either record it right on the spot, or in my case, I took some previous podcasts and webinars I'd done, uploaded that video content into it. And then I can use text to generate videos of me talking. And it looks absolutely 100% spot on. It can't even tell it's not me. In fact, I've shown it to people and they're like, that was just you recording yourself. I was like, no, it wasn't me. And here's how I can prove it. Because HeyGen also lets you do real-time translation. And so then it could be me speaking in Mandarin, me speaking in Spanish, and my mouth actually changes to form the words. And we gave it to um, a student who uh, was, or actually a teacher who knew German. And I, and I showed him, he's like, you know, it's about a 7 out of 10 uh, in terms of how accurate the uh, translation is. He goes, it wasn't that the words were incorrect. It was just like, he could tell that my mouth wasn't perfect on some of the formation. So he's like, that threw him off. Almost like you remember the Japanese kind of uh, martial art films of the, of the late sixties, similar, like your mouth wasn't quite in tune, but it's getting closer. And what I love with that is that gives us potential then to say, okay, you know, I have 22 different languages spoken in my school district. I can all of a sudden send out a message to all 22 of them in their specific language with me talking. Um, so it gives me at least a little bit bridge, uh, bridges some of that gap that maybe in the past you said, well, if you don't speak English, sorry, I guess you're just gonna have to figure out what I'm saying. Um, so now that gives you a better chance. And I feel like that's going to be a lot more inclusive. So I'm excited. I'm just started playing with it. Um, haven't paid for it yet, but I'm pretty sure I will in the next week. Cause again, I just hand the credit card over when a new tool comes out. But that to me is one of the most exciting ones. And I think it has a lot of good potential, which by the way, it also has potential for <laughs> negative consequences. Cause the first thing I thought of was like, Ugh, some kid's going to make their principal say something that they didn't actually say. And you know, that's coming in the next, by the time the school year's over, that all have happened at least once. Someone will get wrongfully fired. Some student will get in big trouble because they made their teacher or a principal or somebody say something they shouldn't. And we'll have no idea because the deep fake is so real. Uh, Not to mention the 2024 election, which is coming at the end of this year. You can only imagine what joy that's going to bring with AI, right? So those are things that I do, I do concern myself with. It doesn't keep me up at night quite yet, but I'm, I'm starting to get a little worried. I want to make sure that we can differentiate. Mm. Yeah. That disinformation and misinformation is, is going to be top of the list, I think. Oh yeah. I mean, you remember 2016 and what social media did and did or didn't do whatever, whatever you believe, whatever. But I think there was influence. And so this will have influence in a different way. And I think us, because we're kind of into it, we're going to be very keen to that. But we know that there's a huge generation of people that aren't keen to it. 
that are going to be kind of duped by it. And I think that's going to be the thing that we got to worry about and be and, and make sure that we're teaching our kids about, especially, I mean, I think our kids are pretty savvy, but that's just that next, you know, media literacy, digital literacy skill that we need to teach them. And to be honest, even those of us who have engaged in it, it's still so early on. It's yeah. hard to know if it's, mm-hmm. if it's real or not. It really is. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, that's vetting of three sources. I mean, making sure you're getting it from ac- yeah, accurate information. There was a principal that was fired a couple of days ago. I don't know if you guys have seen the story. Uh, it was an audio tape. It was a Baltimore principal. Um, he was fired because an audio tape was released of him saying very racist things in, an, in a meeting that someone obviously was recording him as he was going off on uh, people of color. He was going off on, on Jewish people. And basically, he had this whole statement rant. As I listened to it, it's interesting because I was like, man, that's he should be fired. And then I started to actually because I've been working with AI so much, I started thinking somebody could have easily doctored that. And so I started to wonder if that's going to be, and I think he actually did say it by the way, but um, cause he's kind of come back and said, sorry, you know, whatever. But I could see now the next thing will be, well, wasn't me. It was, <laughs> it was the AI me that said it. It wasn't me that actually said it. Right. Um, that's going to be the new excuse. Like when someone hacked your social media account, I didn't post that tweet. It was, <laughs> it was, mm-hmm. it was not me. Right. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. We talked at the very beginning about teachers' concerns changing a little bit over time as they've gotten more used to and comfortable with AI, and that creative thinking and critical thinking piece has become a concern for teachers. They don't want the AI doing all the thinking for them. Do you have any thoughts on how we continue to make sure that students continue to develop their creativity and their critical thinking skills in an AI-infused environment? Yeah, I think, you know, the example I shared with you about making your own image, right, uh, and and how you have to be creative to come up with those images. One thing I've done with um, staff, and, and I've done this with students, with student groups, mostly high school students, is I do a human intelligence versus an artificial intelligence challenge. And so one example I'll do, I do a lot of these different activities where we battle against AI to see the answer types. And for example, I'll give you a quick one that's fun to do. It's about a minute long. And I basically say, all right, I'm going to give you one minute. You and a partner need to come up with as many items that you could find at a barbecue picnic um, and just bounce them off each other, count them as you go, ready, set, go. And I hit the timer and it goes and they go and they list. And the, the highest I've ever heard a group get to is 42, which is still a lot in 60 seconds. I mean, that's a lot of items. Um, average is around 20 ish. Uh, and then I say, OK, now I'm going to ask AI. AI lists 50 things and it lists 50 things found at a barbecue. And as it's listing it, people are watching the list as it grows. and They're like, oh, there was one. There's one. And then when it's over, I'm like, what did it miss? What is something you came up with that it didn't? And all the hands go up. And I'm like, what? They didn't come up with like mosquito bites, sweat, um, good tunes. I mean, like stuff that's more humanistic. It gave us a list of utensils and barbecue propane. And, uh, you know, it very much pragmatically. And I said, that's awesome. So you can see how the infusion of both is going to be so important. You come up with the creative side of things. It's giving you, again, the most generic, basic, what it thinks you want list. And so I think to your question, you know, going back and showing like, here's where it started, challenging students to come up with the creative parts above and beyond what AI can produce uh, right now is pretty easy. I think as AI gets smarter, it'll be harder later on. I think we might have to have parts where we take, we do challenges or mimic some of the things that we think AI might generate. But right now it's really easy to combat it with our own creative element because there's things that AI still can't quite process. And I don't know that it ever will um, just because we're the ones that are inputting the items and we still have a, a layer of creativity in us that, that it can't be reached by technology yet. Cause really it's just pulling databases at this point. Um, and, and it doesn't have all that information. Hmm. So you were starting to th- explain a little bit of things that kind of started to get you to stay up at night, but not really. Right. But, um, as you think about the future of AI, right. What excites you or what's on your mind about the future of AI and education that could be like, yo, this is really digital jazz. I don't know if you've ever seen Tron 2, but you know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. I like that. That's good. I've not heard digital. That's a good. And I like that. Yeah, I I think for me, you know, I'm excited for the fact that and, and we talked about personalized learning, but I also think there's an equity conversation that plays a role here that we that we don't hear enough. And, and when we talk about cheating, I bring this up a lot. 
certain kids get access to tutors because they have the money to do so and they can have a tutor. Oops, there's my little thumbs up icon. Sorry, you can't see that if you're listening. Um, certain kids have access to uh, tutors because they have the money to do so. So they can pay for a tutor to write their college essay. Society, uh, you know, we don't we don't really judge that. We don't say that's cheating. Certain kids have access to a mom or dad at home that aren't working or full time. You know, they're there for them. They're helping them with their work and they help them turn in their work. Again, society, we don't judge them. Certain students have access to really good teachers that give them small group and one on one instruction. Not all kids have access to that. Um, so for the first time, I think in that I can think of, we're actually gonna have an opportunity for kids that don't have access to those humanistic things to actually have that peer kind of help them evaluate, help them revise, help give them feedback, help tutor them that they didn't have before. So I'm excited for the potential of that. Of course, the downside of it is if we block it or certain schools block it, then we've just started to widen the gap yet again. Um, so I'm hopeful for that. And that's the thing that for me, honestly, it's we can finally say we're leveling the playing field. And I think the biggest aha moment for me was last June when Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk and the people that make billions of dollars said, whoa, whoa, slow down. We shouldn't use it. And I was like, when the millionaires are telling you to slow down, it's because they're worried that we're going to take over. <laughs> so like, let's keep using it. Let's keep accelerating because they're obviously concerned that something is going to take over their kind of stance in the world. Um, and so for me, I'm like, this is an opportunity for people that didn't have opportunity before. Um, so I'm excited for it. Again, cost is going to play a role in that too. Some of them, most of them are free right now, but eventually they're going to start charging. And when they do, that's where we're going to have to really keep an eye on it, which is why I like tools like Conmigo, which uses chat GPT and it's in Con Academy has said, you know, free for life. So I'm hopeful that that'll be true for students. So students have access to it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's that time. We, I feel like we could talk about this for much longer, but we got to move into our toolkit. So it's time to ask the question, what's in your toolkit? Check it out. Check it out. Check it out. Check it out. What's in the toolkit? What, what is in the toolkit? Well, what's in the toolkit? Check it out. Winston. Um, I'm going to say this. You, and I mean the Queens you, meaning all of us, teachers, remember that teachers can model to students how to use AI because they're getting so much information about its use outside that could be wrong, uninformed, create a lot of problems. So as teachers reali realizing that we can be the source of critical engagement with AI to support student learning. So remember, we have a lot of control. All right, Paul. I would say uh, go to go to Carl's website. Go to carlhooker.com. He's got all his books on there. You can you can find them there. He's got his blog on there and he's got links to a couple podcasts that he's involved in. Great resources on there. Check out carlhooker.com. All right. Uh Rena. Well, I've so many things, but I'm thinking with the teachers I'm working with Right now, a lot of them are just discovering magicschools.ai and some of just trying some different things on there. And as Carl mentioned, like really measuring some of the things that can be produced on there compared to what they would do on their own and making some informed decisions about what is going to help and what's actually going to cause more stress right now. <laughs> hey, Carl, we'll let you play along too. What, what would you like to drop in our toolkit? Well, let me add real quick and then I'll do mine. But I think to what she was just saying with Magic School, you know that Magic Student is coming out soon. Um, but also uh, the IEP generator in Magic School is a time saver. I wish I had that when I was a teacher. Um, me, I, it's going to be similar to Winston. I think human compassion. And um, I mentioned earlier at the outset about my dad, uh, one of the things he had a will to live like nobody else. And I think what he what he tried to do with his heart was create this, they have this machine called an LVAD that basically pumps his heart for him, he uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to keep him alive a little bit longer. And without that kind of technology and the advancement of AI and, and machine learning, um, my 10 year old, my youngest daughter who's 10, would have never have known her grandfather. She would He would have passed when she, when she was around three years old. And I go, because of the advancements of technology like AI, I think there's a lot of potential for us to be around, be more present, have more time, be more human um, with those around us. So I always say human compassion will never surpass artificial intelligence. Mm. Another T-shirt. Right. <laughs> Paul. <laughs> um, 
So in this segment, it's our one thing. So this is the what's the thing last thing that's running around in your mind that you want to share. What's something you're walking away from this conversation with still um, puzzling? It's time for that one thing. One thing. Paul, Rena, who would like to start? Paul? Um, you know, I do like the idea of AI as a learning partner. I think we need to figure out how we work together. You know, just like we learn to work in groups, we learn to work with collaborators. We need to learn, you know, what the role of AI will be in that collaboration process to make us better, make us more efficient, um, but not suck out the humanness and the creativity out of the process. I think that's going to be an evolution that we're going to have to work through together i was thinking very similarly to paul i love this i i like the stamping of hi human intelligence uh, mm -hmm. so hi versus ai and just making sure that we're transparent and providing opportunities for our educators and for our students to be able to dig into that and understand and have experiences like you talked about with the barbecue or other things and so they have or even when you went into your daughter's classroom i love that example um, of creating a story and then having that comparison so for me it's providing opportunities for that hi versus ai comparison and learning mm. i appreciate that because i that makes that's been what i've been puzzling through and thinking yeah teachers how do you host, stop students from actually being creative that could be a thing right just like in the picture of the student who took a picture like they're engaging with creativity, wanting to do your work. So how are you preventing students to engage with something in a way that's more productive, that allows them to realize that they're co-creating? So sometimes we could be the block. So how do you not be the block? Um, Carl, I'm going to throw it to you. What are you. What's one of the things that you're still thinking about? Uh, right now, there's a lot of uh, pressure on states and local governments to come up with policies and guidelines and guardrails around AI. I just saw one this morning. Um, this kind of goes to what Rena was just talking about. There's the state of Washington just released this morning what they call their human centered artificial intelligence guidelines. I love that kind of terminology of human centered, um, which kind of plays into it a little bit. And I think they're the fifth state that I know of that's come out with a guideline. I think by the time this semester is over by the end of the school year, they'll probably be most states will have some form of that out. Um, it just needs to be flexible. And again, I like the idea of, again, keeping the human in the center. AI is the assistant. AI is the feedback. AI is the tutor, the thought partner. But it's not it's not the learner. Uh, the learner is still the most important part. Mm. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today and we really appreciate you being here with us, Carl. Thanks for thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I want to remind our listeners that Carl's new book, Learning Evolution, The New Era of AI in the Classroom, is available. Um, where's the best place to get it, Carl? Uh, you go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble, mrhook.it slash AI is a short URL that I use to, to direct them so they don't have to go searching for it. But it is in Amazon uh, as a Kindle or paperback. Awesome. Go check it out and uh, look forward to seeing where all this goes. Thanks for listening to Unpacking Education. We invite you to visit us at avidopenaccess.org, where you can discover resources to support student agency, equity, and academic tenacity to create a classroom for future ready learners. We'll be back here next Wednesday for a fresh episode of Unpacking Education. And remember, go forth and be awesome. Thank you for all you do. You make a difference.